Hey everyone, welcome to my beginner's guide for watercolor. Hope this is helpful for you today. We're gonna start with supplies and then move to tips and techniques. So I hope you guys learn lots and enjoy. First one that I'd suggest is the Canson XL cold press with watercolor. It has more of a texture to it. The press is a smooth surface and usually staying at 300 grams, 140 pounds is advised. This is kind of, I would say, medium quality paper. The highest quality is Arches and this is expensive, but it is 100% pure cotton, which is also very great for watercolor. And then another thing I have here is a moleskin uh, sketchbook, which is a great place to practice. So this is my first ever watercolor palette. It's by Windsor and New Newton, and it's the Cotman collection. I highly suggest this as a starter palette because it's not as expensive as professional grade, but then you can experiment with so many different colors. And then if one, you decide you wanna to stick to watercolor, and two, you know which colors you tend to reach for, then you can get professional grade watercolor. So these are some of my professional grade watercolors. These are one by Windsor and Newton, Da Vinci, and Daniel Smith. I have a couple, so those are just some big names. These are professional grade, but this is not what I would start with. Next are paint brushes. Paint brushes are something you collect over time, but I also do think you need to get quality paint brushes. It's really hard to say what size is kind of required for a beginner, but maybe look at what you are trying to paint, like whether it's florals, you know, loose florals are probably gonna be a round brush. If you wanna do houses and stuff, I found it really helpful to have a square shaped brush for bricks. I found that I really always reach for my silver black velvet, although these are more expensive. These two rounds, which are two and six, are my absolute favorite. Collect them over time based off what you find that you end up using. Tape. And the reason that's important for watercolor is when you're putting down your paper, you tape it down to prevent or help with buckling that can happen as you put more and more water on the paper, which I will show. So this is kind of what buckling looks like, is once you've put watercolor to a paper and it absorbs that water, it pops up in weird spots. So to keep it as flat as possible, you put tape around, so that's one. Another key thing, reason you have high quality paper is so that your tape doesn't tear your paper. So pencils, you know, just to do some light sketching. So pencils, pens, and then white in particular, I like to do highlights and things, which I will show later. Whenever you're dipping your paintbrush into your paint, don't go in tip first. Instead, go in at the side of the paintbrush. And the reason for this is because you don't want to damage the tip of the paintbrush. You want to preserve this as much as possible. Always have two jars of water. One is for what you put your dirty brush in right away. And then one that should stay relatively clean because it's the one you rinse right after. Never to leave your, leave your paintbrush in the water jar like this. Again, that's damaging the tip of your brush. Instead, you wanna just lay it flat like this. It's always best to start light versus dark. It's easier to darken up something that's light versus lighten up something that's dark. So for example, this is light, but I can definitely make it darker here, as you can see. If I'm already dark here, it's really hard to now go in and lighten this up. First concept is that watercolor loves water. Your watercolor paint is going to follow wherever you place that water. Once you wet that area and you put paint on it, the paint will not surpass where it is wet and where water is. 
So just sort of a basic concept, which I call watercolor loves water. Okay, so the next important concept here is wet on wet. You wet your paper first, and then you apply wet paint onto that wet paper versus wet on dry where you never wet the paper and you just apply your paint directly onto the paper. So just to show why those techniques look very different on watercolor is because when you wet your paper and you put it on an already wet piece of paper, it, short, it sort of splotches like this, right? You can create different patterns, the water sort of acts at its own will. You can create very cool patterns, abstract backgrounds, loose paints, versus of course doing just wet on dry where you take whatever it is your paint color is with the water and do whatever pattern you wanna do. So I actually went kind of heavy with the paint color here. As you can tell, the paint is only going where I tell it to go with my paintbrush. I have kind of a little bit more control. Fortunately, my footage from earlier regarding blending got deleted, so I am going to quickly try to summarize here. But basically, this is me trying to blend something where both the paint colors were already dry and trying to go in and blend afterwards versus both the paints being wet and then blending, which obviously looks better and more seamless. I'm gonna go ahead and show you. I put down a yellow and I'm gonna get this orange and put it like right next to it. And since they're both wet, I can just take a little bit of clear water and put it right in the middle here. And then it can blend together quite nicely and look more seamless versus if I started with both of them being already dry. And as you can see, although if I work it, it may be possible, it's not gonna look as smooth and as seamless as when they were both wet and I was able to work with them while they were wet. It's harder to blend with paints that have already dried, which is why people will say, make sure you work your backgrounds quickly or whatever you're trying to paint. So here I am showing how I use white paint to basically do something I call glazing, which basically creates the effect of the paint looking milkier and almost changing the tint. Creating highlights. And so I have here three ways that you can create highlights. Um, the first is a technique called lifting, which is lifting your watercolor paint off the paper. I'm gonna rub the clear water on here, right? And you can already tell the paint is lifting a little bit. So rubbing the clear water where I want the highlight, then you take a paper towel, dab it, and there you go. So another way to do highlights are using white pens or gouache. So I have two white pens here. This is one that I've been using forever. It's the Jelly Roll Sakura pens. I haven't really been loving it. Use it again and again. I just feel like it doesn't have the consistency. Like it starts fading a little bit. And I've also found it doesn't really work well against black. It'll start like looking silver. I don't know if you can tell, but it doesn't look white. It looks silver. And I, I hate that it doesn't keep its stark whiteness. So anyway, I was reading on this Facebook group and people were more so recommending this one, which is the Uniball Signo. I actually just got this today and I test tried it a little bit. But I do think, and I can already, like I don't know if you can already tell, but the, this is a lot more opaque than the side one here without me even really trying. Ooh, that one didn't do anything, but see, I, I don't have to exude much effort and it's a lot more opaque than what's happening here. So, ooh, I love this. Yeah, like, do you see how, <laughs> I felt like I was working a lot harder when I was trying to get this white across versus this one. And then, let me see how it looks on the, yep. 
that just looks a lot more bolder and brighter than that one. So then the last one here I put is gouache. It tends, it's a watercolor that tends to be more opaque. So this is the gouache I'm using. It's by Da Vinci in the color white. And as you can see, look at how opaque and beautiful that is. Yeah, gouache is awesome. And it's a really great way to add highlight where you want. And then masking fluid is the other way to create highlights. What I use is by Winsor & Newton Colorless Art Masking Fluid. So I actually already used the back end of a paintbrush to put down this masking fluid. Make sure that when you are using masking fluid, you don't use a brush that you value when you're placing the masking fluid down on the paper because it will ruin your brushes. You don't have to worry about that once it's dry like it is here and you're gonna paint. You, like, you don't have to worry about the brush you're painting on it with. I'm gonna go ahead and just paint. And as you can see, my paint is naturally avoiding those areas with the masking fluid, right? The back of my brush to sort of take this masking fluid off. I don't know if you can tell, but that white of the paper has been 100% preserved. With the tip, you should be able to do a very thin line. Like, I don't know if you can tell compared to the body of the brush. You know, being able to have that tip to create as thin of lines that you would like. And that is extremely helpful. Now, when you're thinking about the body of your brush, and this is actually a concept that is very important when you're painting leaves. Like for example, you use the tip to get to do the tip of the leaf, but then you press down the body of the paintbrush and then rise up. And so then you have these two beautiful tips and then the body. So, you know, you could start with the body and then you could, you know, kind of end with the tip. You can do the body of the brush like this and then go in on the other side and do the body again. Knowing the structure of your brush, right? How to use the tip of the brush versus the body of the brush and taking full advantage of that. Hey okay, everyone, so I hope that was helpful. If you have any further questions or comments, please leave them below and I will talk to you next time.